Good afternoon, and thanks so much for joining us for the latest edition of Bookmarked. My name is Jessica, and I'm a librarian at the Chelmsford Library. With me is my colleague, Deanna, also a librarian in Chelmsford. For today's show, we've elected to record remotely in order to ensure everyone's safety, but we're confident that the content will prove to be just as enjoyable. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we start. Our book groups continue to meet via Zoom, as, do, as does our latest film discussion group, Watch This. Uh, please check our calendar or sign up for our newsletter at chelmsfordlibrary.org O-R-G, to find out about specific dates and times. And if you're a person who can't stick to a specific date and time to discuss a book, you're in luck, as we now have an ongoing book discussion taking place on Goodreads. Uh, Deanna works hard to start interesting discussions that readers can respond to on their own schedule. So check that out at goodreads.com by searching for Chelmsford Classics Book Group or again, by signing up for our library newsletter. Okay, so on with today's show, uh, we have chosen to focus on some contemporary selections of historical fiction today. Um, historical fiction can generally be described as a novel that is set during a certain time in history and attempts to recreate the period with historical facts and figures layered over the plot. Deanna and I have brought along four examples of historical fiction and have chosen to talk about the different ways the authors write in this genre. My first book has been popular with readers for a while. Um, it's called Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk. Kathleen, the author Kathleen Rooney is actually using two time periods for her story, uh, the early 1980s, which serves as a present in the novel, and the 1930s, which serves as a setting for our main character's memories. Uh, the story begins on New Year's Eve in New York City in 1984. Our main character, Lillian Boxfish, is 85 and decides to celebrate by going out for a long walk around the city. Like, why not? Uh, but of course, this doesn't come without a scolding from her son, 43, who is held up in Maine, who continuously nags her about the many ways New York City in the 1980s is unsafe for a woman Lillian's age. Uh, there's worry about a subway vigilante, and in general, as Lillian puts it in her clever quips, uh, the city has become mean-spirited, a mean-spirited action movie complete with repulsive plot twists and preposterous dialogue. Nonetheless, she waves off his worries. She insists on living near her beloved Macy's, her first job and her source, the source of her success. Um, so the character of Lillian Boxfish is, Boxfish is actually a stand-in for the real life character of Margaret Fishback, a uh, renowned poet, illustrator, and ad woman for R.H. Macy's department store in the 1930s. Miss Fishback revolutionized advertising and broke all kinds of barriers during a very difficult time for women in any industry. Not that today is very easy either though. Um, but so as Lillian walks amid her pit stops to local neighborhood bar, which has just installed a TV, oh my gosh, her favorite restaurant that she visits every New Year's Eve, a fancy loft party in which she puts a well-to-do person in their place, a nightclub pouted, populated with young, um, with young artists that equally dismiss and revere Lillian. We are treated to reminiscences of her life in New York and her successful career. But this story is not without pain. Lillian has had a loving husband and son. But there's a good deal of heartbreak in the story much to illustrate the painful choices many women have to make, as well as the pain produced by choices inflicted upon them. So apart from the engaging plot, which is really fun to read, um, as it bounces back and forth between the action and characters that populate the city on that night and those of 1926 and the intervening years, it is a sharp, insightful commentary from a woman so adept at using her words. Rooney really captures the spirit of the time and the figure of Miss Fishback, most of the quips and lines that appear in the book are actual quotes of the work of Margaret Fishback, though many of the events are fictional and even some of the attitudes expressed by Lillian are imagined, but certainly fit well in the context of what research the author performed for the novel. And in that sense, the author has really been able to capture the time period by not focusing too aggressively on the real life events um, on reproducing what already exists, she creates a figure around which the city um, in each period moves. And who doesn't love a story about New York City in any time period? Um, kept that off with a strangely humorous mugging scene and you have a pretty unforgettable story. So I'm just gonna leave you with that hook. <laughs> um, so one of the ways that 
uh, Deanna and I wanted to organize this was we would tell you about one of our favorite examples of the genre. And then we would also bring along a more recent example of the genre, maybe a new book. In my case, it's something that came out in November. So you can read Lillian Boxfish while you're waiting for Rachel Joyce's latest, uh, Miss Benson's Beetle. Um, Rachel Joyce is the author of The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry, which is one of my favorite, favorite books to recommend to people because it's just such a good story about a journey. This one is equally about a journey, but it's more of historical, uh, set, in, set in another time period as opposed to a contemporary time. Um, so it was thoroughly enjoyable. Um, and it's, it's also, like Lillian Boxfish, less concerned with the actual figures of the time period and more concerned with the, uh, the atmosphere of the time period, kind of the zeitgeist, if you will. Um, Ms. Benson's Beetle is set in post-war England uh, for the first part, a war-fatigued society of constant rationing, a generation of left-behind women and disappeared men lost to the war. This is perhaps a most, the most poignant, sad element that Joyce chooses to explore, uh, the vets that have returned shell-shocked or with symptoms of PTSD uh, during the time when most people did not recognize the long-standing damage that war inflicts on people fighting, um, men who are sad and angry and left to their own devices. And all of this is kind of encapsulated in one of the main figures of the story. But before we get to that figure, we get Marjorie Benson. Um, so the story opens, um, she's at the age of 10. Her father, a keen entomologist, shows her a beautiful book of uh, a beautiful book called Incredible Creatures. And these are creatures that are not only rumor, that are only rumored to exist, uh, but not, have not actually been identified. Um, in the sense that they are not yet part of the Museum of Natural History's collection. And this is a refrain that Marjorie keeps bringing up as that these, these creatures, nothing, nothing exists in the world unless it's been captured and identified and pinned and you know, um, given a Latin name by the Museum of Natural History in, in London. So very important. Um, so the most striking of the creatures in this book to Marjorie uh, is the golden beetle of New Caledonia. And New Caledonia is an island off the coast of Australia um, that was a then a uh, territory of France um, with, a, with a British presence. Um, the first scene or chapter reminded me of uh, one of the very first chapters of another historical fiction title uh, called The Guest Book by Sarah Blake. Uh, the chapter ends with a very shocking event that almost ruins the book. You're like, how can, how can the book continue past this point? Uh, but while the novel packs other surprises that unfold slowly, uh, this one is necessary to get out of the way in order to understand the sadness that propels Marjorie to her project. The book then jumps forward 30 years, and Marjorie is now a mostly sad and lonely home and economics teacher in England in 1950. Something has happened in those 30 years that has made her, that has put her in the position she is. But suddenly one day upon realizing the degree to which her students are making a fool of her appearance, she's sad, she's let go, she's drab, she needs a haircut, uh, she commits a very unusual out of character but punishable act and flees the school. Needless to say, she's relieved of her position and finds herself without a vocation. Another common, re another refrain that's repeated by the uh, characters over and over. Uh, so she decides this, this is the time to do what she's always dreamed. Travel across, to the, travel across the world to New Caledonia, the home of the Golden Beetle, and bring back specimens to be added to the museum's collection. So in addition to practicalities like saving money and accumulating supplies for the voyage, she decides that she needs an assistant. And after several failed attempts at recruiting, she gets Enid Pretty. <laughs> She's a great character. A seemingly ditzy polar opposite to Mar Marjorie's stoic popularity. She even begins by calling her Marge without invitation, just um, which is Marjorie is very annoyed by. But of course, the most, as with most stories of this sort, once they are stuck in the thick of the journey, facing all of the challenges that truly test their resilience and fortitude, and despite the sad histories of loss each carries with them, they find they make the best possible pair. Do they find the beetle? Well, of course you'll have to read it to find out. And that's really only half the story anyway. It's a story in the vein of a classic adventure, polar opposites thrown together on a strange journey in a strange new world neither could ever imagine themselves in before. It's a fantastic story of travel and friendship, so many of the things that we need that we might be missing right now. Um, and I highly re recommend it uh, for a winter read. And so 
Deanna, what did you bring with you today? Oh, well, thanks, Jess. Um, and uh, thanks for adding two more books to my to be to be read list. Awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I've brought um, a couple of examples of this genre, uh, but uh, historical fiction about um, I like these in particular because I like as I'm reading to wonder, you know, what is real, what is imagined. Um, I like speculating about people from the past, like how they acted, like why they acted the way they did, what they thought, how they felt. Um, and then I always look forward to the afterward where the author tells us, you know, about the real person and about their research. And I feel like I'm learning something at the same time as reading a good book. So both of the books I'm talking about today fall into to this category. And so the first one is Florence Adler Swims Forever by Rachel Beanland. Um, and so for this one, within the first few pages, we discover that 20 year old Florence Adler, who is uh, training to swim across the English Channel, has died on one of her practice swim runs. Mm -hmm. um, very devastating for her family, of course, um, but it's made even more distressing because her older sister, Fanny, is on bed rest at the local hospital. She's having a very difficult pregnancy. So fearing that the loss of her sister might, you know, bring about early labor and endanger Fanny and her unborn child, their mother makes this decision that they're not going to tell Fanny that Florence has died. So the rest of the story kind of unfolds over the next two months. Um, it's told in the point of view of various family members and friends of Florence. And so we learn, you know, like how they fare after uh, Florence dies, how they grieve, um, how they go about keeping the secret from Fanny. And we also learn about their own stories as well. So this is a debut novel. And for this author, uh, she chose to write about something that really happened in her family. Uh, Florence was a real person. Uh, it was the, she was the author's great, great aunt. Uh, she did indeed drown and they did indeed keep her death from her pregnant sister, though they only had to do it for two weeks instead of two months, which I think makes <laughs> sense. Um, it's been really well received. Um, it, it, it came out this past summer and it was a b and Book Club pick. Um, lots of great things to talk about for book club. Um, and it's gotten very um, positive reviews. So I think the one big um, sticking point for people is that you know, question of the likelihood of being able to keep such an enormous secret um, for so long. Um, lots of great reasons to, to read this book. Um, the characters, the author does a really good job of kind of getting into their thoughts and their motivations as they deal with uh, the loss of, of Florence. And we get to know them all through their own thoughts and actions. Um, and we get to know everybody, uh, strangely, except for Florence, um, who we only know from how um, other people perceived her and how they are grieving her. And so, you know, by the end, we see, you know, what a remarkable kind of driven young woman she was who's going to be missed by her family. Um, so the historical angle is that it takes place in 1930s Atlantic City. Uh, so you get kind of a taste of the 30s, the social and cultural atmosphere, uh, the gender roles of the times. And there are a couple of interesting you know, subplots that are very particular to the time period. Um, the Adlers are Jewish. So there is a subplot relating to immigrants fleeing Germany and coming to the US you know, for sanctuary. And it's, it's strange to read because we as readers know that the Holocaust is, is coming, but the characters, they just know something bad is happening in Germany and something, you know, bad is on the horizon, but, you know, they have no idea what is, what is coming. Um, and the other subplot kind of deals with, with this uh, land speculation that went on up and down the Eastern seaboard at that time period, kind of from New York to, to Florida. So very interesting there. And like I said, a really great book club title. Um, talk, you know, not the least to talk about the mother's decision to not tell Fanny, you know, about Florence's uh, death. And then thinking about how that utter secrecy would be uh, pretty much impossible in our digital social media age oh, right oh. now. Right. So if you like, um, if you liked the um, books like Little Fires Everywhere, you know, that we read for book group mm -hmm. uh, by Sang, or if you liked Dutch House by Ann Patchett, you know, this is, um, you know, this would be a, a great book for your next read. Awesome. Sounds great. Yeah. And then the second book, uh, which is a completely different kind of book, is called In the Garden of Spite. It's by Camilla Bruce. And this book is about a woman named Belle Gunness, uh, who was a serial killer in the Midwest um, at the 
turn of the century. So the book takes place kind of in the late 1800s through the early 1900s. Um, Belle was a Norwegian immigrant and she was fleeing a very bad situation in Norway. She came uh, to the US to live with her sister Nellie in Chicago. And the narrative goes back and forth between Belle and her sister Nellie. And, and Belle was a very, she was smart, she was ambitious. And you know, for that time, she really had like no compunction about going after what she wanted, right? So whether it was a husband or a candy shop or a new house or children of her own, but uh, she was a broken human being. And so when she had it, you know, the, she didn't want it anymore. All that glamor faded away and she invariably blamed the men in her life for her problems. Um, and since she was a serial killer, this uh, turned out very badly for all of those women. So, um, but this book has been uh, getting really great re early reviews. Um, it's got a starred review in Publishers Weekly, uh, averaging four stars on Goodreads. And the thing that lured me in was the publisher tagline. They called it uh, an audacious tale of feminine rage. Oh. <laughs> you know, right? So if uh, that's not enough to draw you in, um, I also think, you know, the author does a really good job of showing Belle's character. Know, through her to through her youth in Norway, um, to her time in Chicago, and then she moved to Indiana. And while she's not attempting to, to make you sympathetic to Belle, I mean, she is a serial killer. Um, she does help kind of understand her from her perspective and from the perspective of her sister. And then, like I said, it's a turn of the century Chicago. And so, you know, it's interesting to, to read a little bit about that immigrant experience. You know, people came here searching for a better life, but, you know, they didn't have a lot of money. They didn't speak the language. And so, so there was there was struggle. And they ended up in communities of similar immigrants. Like in this case, they lived in a community of Norwegian immigrants in Chicago because, um, you know, they needed support and it reminded them of home all this while while they're trying to build something better here. Um, and lastly, I also think this would be a really great book club title, um, especially to talk about Belle's character and also to talk about, you know, the dilemma that her sister is in. Her sister, you know, has known her her whole life. They grew up together and she remembers that um, at the same time as she's horrified by what her sister has become, right? So, you know, people who like historical mysteries might like this, though I will um, put out a warning that this is a bit grislier than the usual historical mystery. Um, if you like true crime, if you like listening to those podcasts that kind of get into the mind of a spoiler, like that's kind of what I was reminded of when I was reading this. Um, and if you liked uh, that book, um, The Devil in the White City mm -hmm. by Eric Larson, set in the same time period. And um, that killer actually gets a, a shout out oh. in this book. <laughs> um, and this one, like I said, is out in January. So uh, one to look forward to. Awesome. Some excellent uh, selections there. Thank you so much, Deanna. Um, so now it's time for our lightning round. And for the lightning round, in case you hadn't um, been a part of uh, or watched the last episode that we did, um, the lightning round is where we have each brought three books and we're just gonna go through them really quick, give you some highlights that are gonna grab you and make you wanna pick up these, uh, these new books. Uh, so my first book uh, got a lot of buzz. I think it was on a few lists from last year or for this year, 2020 lists. Um, we're not done yet. <laughs> um, is the Office of Historical Corrections by Danielle Evans. Uh, this is a collection of short stories and a novella that Kirkus calls Necessary narratives brilliantly crafted. The storytelling is gripping. The plots are simple in essence, but dressed up in wit and wry observation about the nuance of race relations and what it means to exist as a black figure in a world that unless you are a black figure, seems to consider race to be irrelevant or not a struggle. What I, sh what I love about this collection in particular is Evans's commitment to the short story form she describes it in an interview as a vehicle that best allows the author to explore all of the different ways a question can be answered. In one story, a young college student in Vermont allows herself to be photographed by her boyfriend wearing a Confederate flag bikini. When the vi post photo goes viral, Black student organizations vilify her, while other students hail her as a symbol of freedom of expression. What happens to the young woman's outlook and attitude is remarkable as she is bandied back and forth and made a catalyst for debates about race and freedom of expression. The story's novella focuses on an organization called the Office of Historical Corrections, which seeks to find and correct instances of historical inaccuracy 
such as a bakery marketing cakes to celebrate Juneteenth. The story becomes complicated when a young woman working for the group is asked to investigate one of her own colleagues involving her in a possible murder mystery. So this uh, novel, novella turns. Um, all of the stories in the collection though, oh, those are just two examples, are so tight and re re revelatory in their twists and very, very absorbing. So that's the Office of Historical Corrections by Daniel Evans. Mm, great, that sounds great. Um, my first one is Prodigal Son by Greg Hurwitz. Um, this is the latest book in his Orphan X series, which is one of my favorite series. Um, if you haven't read it before, Evan Smoke is uh, Orphan X. When he was a young boy, he was taken from an orphanage and trained to be a pretty much a lethal assassin in a clandestine intelligence department. Um, he's left that life behind and in atonement, he's become the nowhere man where he uses the skills that he's learned um, to help people who are basically down to their last chance and he is their last hope. So, you know, as you might imagine, kind of morphing from something like the orphan program into real life, that assimilation is very difficult. And in this latest book, it only gets more complicated because his mother, um, who abandoned and in him has found him and asks him for help. Um, and despite himself, he gets pulled in to, to helping her. And, uh, you know, like I said, this, this latest entry into the series is just as strong, if not better than uh, the last. And it's for fans um, of what I like to call no rules thrillers. So if you like Lee Child or John Connolly, um, Joseph Fender, Nick Petrie, then this, this series is for you. The first book in the series is called Orphan X, or if you're all caught up, this new one, Prodigal Son, uh, is new in January. Sounds great. Um, my next uh, book is White Ivy by Susie Yang, another book that was receiving a lot of buzz on its release. Um, it's a debut by the author, uh, Susie Yang. Ivy begins, um, that our main character Ivy begins her life in China, raised by her grandmother until she's five when she's sent to her parents in the US. Shortly after her grandmother follows to the US as well. And uh, one of the most important things that she begins to teach Ivy is shoplifting and how to, and, and also general deception with the goal of being able to get anything she wants in life. So Ivy grows up with this lesson and alongside it, a, grow, a growing self-loathing for who she is and a desire to be rich, white, and pretty. She develops a crush on a wealthy classmate, a wealthy classmate, which will fizzle and then reemerge years later when Ivy has seemingly perfected her disguise to the point where she, her true self has almost disappeared. That is, of course, until another old friend emerges and threatens to tear everything apart. It's a gripping read, part thriller, part romance, part social commentary, and all beautifully and sharply written. So that's White Ivy by Susie Yang. Mm, that sounds good. It reminds me of a book I read earlier this year, Pretty Little Things. Mm. Kind of the same, a little bit of the same plot lines. Um, the next book that I have to, to talk about is The Mystery of Mrs. Christie by Marie Benedict. Um, kind of still in the, the spirit of historical fiction about real people. Uh, this one is about Agatha Christie. And, uh, she famously, she disappeared for about two weeks and there's always been, you know, wild speculation as to, to where she went during that time. So in this book, the author plays around with, you know, what might have happened during that time and more importantly, why it happened. So it, the narrative goes back and forth um, in time, tracing her life um, and her relationship with her husband, um, who uh, becomes under suspicion when she disappears. Um, the ending is truly, you know, an homage to Agatha Christie, you know, with the dramatic, you know, like Hercule Poirot would do, um, and ends in a way that, that I personally found, you know, extremely satisfying. Um, I think if you're a fan of Agatha Christie, you would like this, um, but if you like a good historical mystery, you know, this uh, book is out in January, The Mystery of Mrs. Christie by Marie Benedict. Well, uh, I know so many people who are fans of Mrs. Is Christy and are going to really want to pick that up. That sounds great. Um, so my last book is called Black Buck by Matteo Ascarapur. Um, and this one comes out in January and is also a debut by the author. Uh, but I saw an interview with him recently and he is very enigmatic. Um, it's set up uh, in the author's words, like a manual for the aspiring black salesman, which is supposed to be funny. 
Uh, the book is Satirical Eviscerating Examination of Contemporary Corporate Culture. Uh, the book's main character is a young man, Darren, living in Bedford Stuyvesant with his mother in New York. And he's mostly content and happy with his seemingly simple life. Uh, he's got a girlfriend, a job as a barista at Starbucks in Manhattan. But others in his life believe that he could be, he could be doing more. I mean, he was top of his class when he graduated high school. Um, he finally agrees and connects with a friend who gives him a job at a startup, even before Darren knows what the startup actually is doing. Um, Darren quickly becomes wrapped up in the money and fast pace of the tech world, uh, but this does some damage to his personal relationships, and then comes the drop, um, almost as sudden as the climb. The book is framed by the constant asides from the author directly to the reader, uh, which maintain the darkly comic tone of the novel. Uh, for readers who like Paul Beatty's The Sellout or some of the writing by Colson Whitehead, this is a sure bet. Oh, great. Well, uh, my last book is a book called Moonflower Murders by Anthony Horowitz. Um, and Anthony Horowitz is uh, kind of not a um, that I would read it because uh, I, I think he's kind of a contemporary equivalent to Agatha Christie. You know, he creates mysteries and characters and plots that are very reminiscent of, of Clara Christie novels. Um, so Moonflower Murders features Susan Ryland, who was the main character in his previous book, The Mad Pie Murders. And as just a quick background, um, she is the former editor and publisher of a fictitious author named Alan Conway, who wrote um, a series of mysteries by, um, featuring a detective called Atticus Punt. So after the events of Magpie Murders, uh, Susan is now living a new life, more or less happily, in, on Crete, uh, running a hotel with her boyfriend. And she is approached by an English couple whose daughter has disappeared. And it seems that her disappearance is tied into an old murder that happened at a fancy hotel um, that actually this family runs, and about which Conway based one of his Atticus Pond mysteries. And so they have come to her as Conway's former editor in the hopes that they can, they, Susan can help them find their daughter. Um, so I've just started reading it. You know, it's already like very intriguing. I'm already totally pulled into it. So, I, you know, if you haven't read him before, you know, I would say start with Magpie Murders. But if you've read that, Moonflower Murders is out now uh, and ready for you to read. That's great. Thank you so much, Diana. Deanna. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. I hope that you managed to collect some great titles that you can come to the library and check out. Um, we are open um, at the moment uh, with limited service and we are also available for curbside service. So give us a call, go online, um, get our website at chelmsfordlibrary.org. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye. Bye. <laughs>